When it comes to single use, we might be better off focusing on paper rather than plastic, says leading scientist Christy Armet. He's the author of Phantom Plastics, a book that debunks the prevailing thoughts about plastics. He points out that the banks of Canada and England both study plastic versus paper for the country's money, and in both jurisdictions, the decision was to print plastic money rather than paper because plastic was better for the environment. Heresy, you say. How can that be? D.R. Metz says, life cycle analysis is the answer. Plastic money has three times the lifespan of paper. And when looking at the total impact of paper money, the carbon footprint and environmental costs far exceed that of plastic. D.R. Metz says, you, you take a look at the weight of paper. The extra fuel required to transport paper over plastic is just one element in the life cycle analysis of money, and then add in the impact of harvesting trees, mashing them into pulp and paper, and the limited lifespan, and it all adds up to plastic being the better choice. Diarmet says litter is another factor, and he points out litter is created by people, people, he says, who can stop doing that by making better choices. According to D.R. Met, when you attach value to plastic, it does not clog up drains or end up in the sewer or the oceans. And the proof of that is in money. He says there are more than 8 billion plastic bank notes printed globally each year, and they do not get discarded. We invited Dr. Chris D.R. Met to join us for a conversation that matters about plastics, the myths and misconceptions. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Chris, welcome. You've written a fascinating book, <laughs> The Plastic Paradox. Why did you write it? I wrote it because one day my kids came home from school. I have two daughters and they came home and they've been taught things which I knew as a scientist were just lies. And uh, I found that to be unacceptable. And then I realized, well, where do teachers get their information from? They're, they're just human beings like the rest of us. They pick things up from the press and they don't really have a source of credible information. So that's where my quest began was to spend a year reading hundreds of scientific articles to get the facts and then present them for the teachers, which I actually did yesterday. I presented at the elementary school yesterday for the, the teachers and the kids. Well, let's come to the reaction from the teacher in a moment. First, however, I want to establish your credentials. You're not just a scientist. You're a scientist with decades of experience specializing in plastics. Tell me about your history in the plastics industry. Sure. Well, I became fascinated with plastics when I was studying my degree in chemistry in England, and a professor came to me and said, Professor Norman Billingham, who's a very famous polymer scientist, and he said, you should study plastics because there's a lot of demand and not much supply of experts. So that's where my career as a plastic scientist began. And I've been in Germany and Sweden, America, I've traveled all around the world, always as a plastic scientist. So I don't make or sell or market plastics. I'm dealing with the technical aspects only of plastics. At the time you entered the plastics industry, the perception about plastics was very different from today. At that time, plastics were valued and appreciated, which is a very different mindset from the one that we have today. You know as well as I do, there's a growing chorus of voices asking, no, demanding a world without plastic. However, if we did that, our way of life would come crashing to a halt. That's right. And that's really what the paradox is about. We know that um, paradox is where you have contradictory information. So um, the paradox is that we know we need plastics. We really can't live today's society and the way that we live today. We can't maintain that without plastics. And on the other hand, we're told that they're bad. So which one is it? They, they can't both really be true. They can't be good and bad at the same time. So the plastics paradox was to set about answering that question. Um, are plastics good or bad? What do we really know? Well, which one is it? Are they good or are they bad? They're good. If you look at all the science, they're good and it's unequivocal. There's no way to argue with that. If you look at the, if the fact, if the facts are what's important for you, there's no way to argue against it. Okay. What makes plastics good? So the only way to know if something is green or not is to do a life cycle analysis, which is a lot of work, right? So LCA mm -hmm. for short, this is what I taught the kids yesterday. You look at what are the raw materials needed to make them to make your plastic or wood or whatever else you're making. What are the raw materials? What's the manufacturing process? What kind of logistics are involved? Is it transported by plane or by train or by bus? 
how much gasoline goes into that. You look at the carbon dioxide emissions. You look at all the chemicals used. You even look at loss of life. Are people dying making this product? You add it all up and you work out how green is this material. And by mm -hmm. using this method, which governments use it, Greenpeace uses it, it's the only accepted method in the world. By adding all of this thing, all these things up, you can compare wood and metal and glass and plastic and work out which is the greenest solution. And that's what people have done. So a drink container, which has been pointed out to me, is the leading contributor to plastic garbage, especially in regions that do not have clean drinking water. The sheer volume of bottles that are consumed and then thrown away without appropriate garbage collection facilities is staggering. Are you saying that even that is better than the alternative? I would say a lot of plastic bottles are not needed in the first place. So I, I'm not one to say that we should all be buying plastic bottles. My children at school learn needs versus wants, right? You need a glass of water, but you want a bottle of pop, right? The, you don't need the soda and you don't need the bottle either. So I would say a lot of this is to do with not taking things you don't need in the first place. But if you do need something, often you need, like you said, sanitary water in an area. So should it be in paper or should it be in plastic? When you do the life cycle analysis, comparing those, if you compare a plastic bottle to a glass bottle to an aluminum can, the PET bottle wins every time. And it's by a wide margin. Can you please define PET? <laughs> so like a regular soda bottle that you see, like a Coke bottle or a, a bottle of water that you buy in the supermarket, that's a PET bottle. It's made of polyethylene terephthalate. That's the proper name, but that's too long for people to say and impossible to spell. So people call it PET instead. So when you buy that plastic bottle versus a glass one or an aluminum can, what does the life cycle analysis tell us? Well, I have information in my book with the exact numbers. So I, I would refer to people to the book or my website for exact numbers. But uh, basically, you're, if you're going from a plastic bottle to an aluminum can, you might be using double the energy, creating double the waste and, and double the CO2 as well for global warming. If you look at glass, it's much worse. Glass creates a huge amount more waste. And people will, of course, tell you glass is recyclable. But, right. but even if you're a kid, you can realize to recycle glass, you have to heat it up. It's like molten lava, right? You have to heat it up to thousands of degrees to melt glass and recycle it. To melt plastics, you only need a couple hundred degrees. So that's one of the main reasons why glass is greener. You can process it at much lower temperatures than you, you can mean metal plastic is glass. greener. You just said glass is greener. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> plastic is greener because it processes at a couple hundred degrees, whereas metal and glass, you need much higher temperatures to melt them. In your book, you talk about Sweden's experience with recycling glass. That was actually the first time I heard about life cycle analysis back in the 90s. A friend of mine called Bank, who worked for a big pharmaceutical company, told me that when you do the life cycle analysis, you're better off going to the beach and getting fresh sand and making glass that way. Because in Sweden, they collect all the glass together, they truck it to Norway, where they then melt it at thousands of degrees and then send it back again. And by the time you've put in all those trucking costs and all of the melting and everything, it's just not friendly to collect glass and recycle it. So everyone in Sweden was feeling great that they were really ahead of the curve and they're doing the right thing for the environment. But in reality, they were harming the environment by not doing the greenest thing. And that's why life cycle analysis is so important. If you don't start off with the facts, you end up harming the environment instead of helping it. Is that your big concern? Namely, that people are making decisions that are ill-informed and in doing so, they may actually be harming the environment, the very environment they're seeking to protect. That's the irony. The people who care the most are doing the most harm because they're really vociferous. They're out there voting. They're asking for change. They're shouting at the top of their lungs and they're demanding the wrong things. The people who really care are demanding changes which are certain to harm the environment. There's absolutely no question. And politicians are listening. Companies are listening. And we're harming the environment because no one spent the time to go get the facts. Well, right now in Vancouver, they're banning plastic drinking straws and mandating that they be replaced with paper straws. I know. I'm totally with you on that. People of our age remember why we don't use paper straws anymore, because they're no good. Um, you can <laughs> barely use them for one drink, and they're not as green as the plastic straws. My daughter used the same plastic straw every day for three months. She rinsed it, and she used it in her drinking water for at nighttime for three months. It was as good as new. So just because something's called single-use or thought of as single-use doesn't mean we have to throw it away after one use. Uh, well, you highlighted an important part there, that being the responsibility each of us has in making choices. For example, we can reuse plastic straws if we choose to, and that is the responsible choice. 
That's right. I mean, people don't really want the responsibility. They always want to blame something else. That's in human nature. We, the last thing we want to do is blame ourselves. We drive our car into a tree and blame the tree. Everyone does it, right? I'm not immune from that. But if we really want to make progress, we have to place the blame correctly so that we can find the right solutions. So you say a paper straw is more environmentally harmful than a plastic one. Can you explain the reasoning or science behind that statement? Well, here's an interesting thing. If you start with trees, usually wood is greener than plastic, right? It's the only thing I found that's consistently greener than plastic. Mm -hmm. But to make paper, you have to grind the tree up into the fibers. It's an incredibly energy intensive process. You have to use a lot of water. You have to use a lot of chemicals and bleaching agents to make that paper straw. So by the time you've made that paper straw, it's used more CO2 and more energy and more chemicals than making the plastic straw. And you've also got a straw that weighs twice as much. So when that paper straw is done after one drink, it weighs two grams. The plastic straw can be used a hundred times and it weighs one gram. It is far, far more beneficial to the environment to use a plastic straw. Or if you really care, don't take a straw. If you don't have special needs, nobody needs a straw, right? Just don't take one, it's as simple as that. When I go to the grocery store, they now ask me if I want paper or plastic. And I've been led to believe that paper is the better environmental choice, <laughs> but you say it isn't. That's right. So one easy thing to do if you haven't got, first of all, life cycle analyses have been done on plastic bags. It's one of the most studied things I've ever found. So I found about 10 studies, they're all on my website, in Denmark, in Sweden, in, in Canada, more than one in America. Every life cycle analysis ever done says that paper is worse than plastic. It's absolutely clear, and cotton's far worse than plastic. There is no argument anywhere about it. So you should always pick the plastic bag because it's the best thing for the environment. Another thing you can do if you don't have a life cycle analysis in front of you is just weigh them. I've got a Kroger bag, which I showed to the kids at the elementary school yesterday. It weighs 60 grams. The Kroger plastic bag weighs five and a half grams. That means whenever you take that paper bag, which is worse for the environment, you're generating 10 or 11 times more waste which is absolutely preposterous. So you're right, people are charging us fines to use the greenest option. I mean, it's truly incredible that a company with the resources of Kroger are now banning, I heard, plastic bags. These companies are making decisions based on our wishes, but they didn't go away. Either they know what's really green, there is some evidence that the supermarkets actually know what is green, and they are mm -hmm. forced to listen to us because we're the customers. Or it could just be that um, some of them are ignorant of the facts. I found it very interesting that both the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada chose plastic money over paper. Right. In that case, paper and plastic come out pretty similar per bill, but the plastic bag, the plastic um, note lasts about three times longer than the paper one. So these people don't realize, people in America don't realize that plastic banknotes have been around in the world since the 80s. Their, their standard currency in Australia and several other countries have plastic notes because they're almost impossible to tear and they last a long time and it's easier to put good counterfeiting measures into them compared to paper. So there's a lot of plastic banknotes out there all around the world. What about plastics in landfills? Do they deteriorate? Well, it's a funny one. People don't realize that landfills are designed to trap carbon. We don't want things to decompose because they give off carbon dioxide and it leads to global warming. So landfills are designed so that nothing degrades. They've done archaeology on landfills, right? There's a book called Rubbish! Exclamation mark. And they literally dug down in landfills to find out what's in them, how much plastic is there, all the other stuff. And they found out you can pull out newspapers from 50 years ago. It's made of paper and you can still read it. You can pull out steaks and avocado and guacamole, and it looks like it was just put there last week, but it's really 10 or 20 years old because there's no oxygen in a landfill. It's designed to keep everything there without degradation. So this mm -hmm. argument that environmentalists use that plastics won't degrade in a landfill is preposterous because an apple won't degrade in a landfill and neither will a newspaper. They're not supposed to degrade there. Still, do plastics degrade? And if yes, at what rate? So plastics are made of organic material. And to a lay person, that means that apples are made of organic material. We're made of organic material. Anything with carbon is organic, right? And that's what plastics are made of too. So if you take a regular piece of plastic, like a they say that plastics last a thousand years, right? And this is what triggered my response at school. They told my kids plastics last a thousand years. And I know that that's just an outright lie. If you take a polyethylene bag and put it outdoors, it's gone and fragmented into dust in a year. And that's been done. Scientists have done that. So environmentalists are telling us plastics last 500 years or a thousand years, and it's just rubbish. They've done the experiment and we know it's not true. In fact, plastics, unless you add stabilizers to protect them, just fall to pieces in front of your eyes. Polypropylene is another common plastic, and that will fall to pieces at room temperature in one year. 
less than one year. So the two most common plastics on the planet are both able to fall to pieces in less than a year, unless you specifically put in chemicals to protect them. That is how unstable they are. And yet these environmentalists are telling us that they last a thousand years. I made a joke in my book, go to Lowe's or Home Depot and ask for a piece of plastic with a thousand year guarantee and they will laugh their socks off. Everybody knows in the real world that plastic doesn't last a thousand years. My car bumper doesn't last a thousand years. Nothing does. We know that. But and yet somehow we believe it when the environmentalists tell us it's nonsense. I want to go back to something you just said. You said plastics are an organic material. I'm under the impression plastics are made from oil or propane. Right. So oil is organic. Uh, oil is made from the decomposition of, uh, of ancient uh, tree life and stuff like that, vegetation. And so that's, that was organic. And when it decomposes, it gives oil and coal, which are organic. And then when you make polymers from those or plastics, that's also organic material. It's carbon bonds holding everything together. When it comes to recycling glass, I know you can mix post-consumer glass by blending different types of glass together. Post-consumer plastics, however, are different in that you cannot mix types of plastics in recycling. How do we address that challenge? Right. So the first thing to know is that recycling plastics fundamentally is very simple, right? You take a piece of plastic like a polyethylene bag and you stick it in a frying pan and you melt it and you make a new shape, right? It's easy. Mm -hmm. It's like melting wax. So fundamentally, almost all plastic is recyclable. The trouble is when you mix them together, as you're alluding to, when you mix plastics together, they don't behave very well. They don't really, they don't really mix in the, mel in the molten state, right? So you end up with droplets of one inside another one, and you get a part with not very good mechanical properties. So that's a problem. A big thing is down to how well you can sort those plastics. You need to sort the polyethylene into one pile, the polypropylene into another pile, and the PET into another pile, and melt them together with each other rather than just blending them. And that's a challenge, but it's a challenge which has been overcome in most countries. America's way behind on this. We only have about 9% recycling of plastics. In Europe, the number's 50% on average and up to 75% in some countries. So this is something which is easily done and it is done, but America's chosen not to invest in the infrastructure to do it. I was at Globe 2020 and there was a lot of talk about plastics and it was identified this issue of being able to sort plastics that go into, you know, a uh, transfer station. How do you separate out those plastics and do it quickly and efficiently under a scanner? Well, uh, there is this move towards putting polymers into the plastic that immediately identify that plastic so that it can make uh, sorting possible and efficient. Do you see this as a viable concept? Absolutely. Many regions use up to 50% or even more of recycled plastic. So it can be done and it is being done on a huge scale all around the world, just not in America. Well, so I understand in that. Brazil, oh, I understand in Brazil, they're, they've, they've been doing this for quite some time. Right. And in Europe, as I said, the average is 50% and we're at 9%. So this is something I ask myself as a scientist. People will ask me something and I'll look around the world and say, is this done anywhere? Right. Is there anywhere that's made this work? And if, if the answer is yes, then you say, hey, this is, there's no fundamental reason we can't be doing this because it's already been proven. Please share the story of the young woman you were sitting next to on a plane with a sticker on her computer calling for a world without plastic. Yeah, she was taking a nap and she had this sticker on her laptop and it said rise above plastics. Right. And I thought it's so funny because the sticker was plastic, the adhesive was plastic, the laptop was plastic, and her shoes were plastic. They're made of nylon, right? Her backpack was a nylon backpack. She had on polyurethane um, insoles in her shoe, uh, like the, the cushioning in your shoes was polyurethane. If I looked at the whole of her, the only thing I could see that wasn't plastic was a, a cotton jacket. Um, and so it was just ironic. She's sitting there. She, she had been editing some uh, soft, some uh, footage shot on a plastic GoPro. She was editing it on her plastic laptop. It was just insane, right? Almost everything that made her life what it was, was made of plastic. And yet she had this silly sticker that said, rise above plastics. Not to mention most of the airline seat she was sitting in was made of plastic. That story demonstrates how ubiquitous plastics are and that the consequences of banning plastics would be devastating to the, our way of life. I don't think everyone's sincere in their wish against plastic, right? There's a tendency of human beings to go with the mob, right? So everybody's out there virtue signaling. They're all shouting, let's down with plastics. Let's, let's be good for the environment. But they don't really mean it. Nobody wants to give up their phone. They, nobody wants to give up having electricity in their houses. Nobody wants to give up medicines and, uh, and medical equipment and all of the other things that keep us alive, which are all made, or our cars, which are made of plastic. Nobody would give up any of that stuff. A lot of this is people out there virtue signaling, shouting to make themselves look like a good person, when in fact they have no nothing against plastics at all. 
So there are, there are some people who are truly against plastics. And if those people really were sin sincere in their beliefs, they'd be off living in a cave somewhere with no running water and no electricity. But these people are not living in a cave. They're typing on their plastic laptops, telling us what great people they are and how they want to get rid of plastics. And I'm like, well, if, if that were true, you wouldn't be typing anything on the internet because you'd be sitting in a cave with a campfire in front of you. You also say the only thing worse than single use is zero use. Everybody talks about single use and it got me thinking something that really frustrates me is I get one or two pounds of litter de delivered to my letterbox every day and to my driveway, right? They throw this local newspaper on there, which I never asked for. It's a giant thing. And then there's all of this spam, right? It's coming in my letterbox. It's, it's brochures I never asked for. It's newspapers, it's flyers. All this stuff was never asked for and it's zero use. It's pounds of it every day and it goes directly in the trash can without ever being looked at. It's literally zero use. So if you look at waste, paper and cardboard is double the amount of plastic. Chris, I like your perspective. You appear to be saying, don't be wasteful. Don't use something you don't need to. Don't replace something that works just because you can. In other words, you're saying we all need to take responsibility for the choices we make. But let's make informed choices. It's a message that when it comes to plastics, I don't think is being heard. I don't think you are being heard. You know what? I don't mind. If I've done my best, if I spent a year of my life, people criticize me sometimes. They're like, well, you, you're a plastics guy. You're going to defend plastics. And if you read the book, it's not a defense of plastics. It's a presentation no, of it's the facts. Not. When yeah. plastics win or when they don't win. As I said, wood often comes out on top. But I don't mind because I will have spent a year of my life reading hundreds of articles and I will have made this book and I would have made it available to everybody who cares. I'm going to make a video for school children to watch. I'm going to make sure that people who do care, and even if it's a minority, even if it's two or three percent or five percent of people who actually care enough to read the facts, I will have done my best and I'll feel good about it. I'm not naive enough to think I'm going to change everyone's mind. A lot of these people are, you know, they're just not interested in facts. They've decided that they're more righteous than everyone else and they're going to do X, Y, and Z irrespective of the facts. Uh, and I, but I do find it ironic that the people who think themselves most virtuous are too lazy to actually check the facts before they go and act. Uh, so that's the irony of it. Some of these people who are most passionate and feel that they're most virtuous are doing the most harm. Well, we make the, we frequently make decisions to make us feel good, but we're unaware of the unintended consequences. That's right. That's right. It's unfortunate, so, but that's human nature. So, for someone who's interested in learning more, where can they go to get a copy of your book? It'll be on Amazon. And uh, at some point, I'm going to make it available for free because books are not about making money. Books are about getting information in front of people. And that's what especially this book is about. So at some point, I'm going to make it free for everybody because it's about getting good information in front of people and, and making a difference. It's not about selling books. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you joining me.